All right, I've been eyeing this little teleprompter over here. So when I speak in Navajo, I'm really excited to see what it does. All right. All right, all right. So good evening, everybody. My name is Kyle Mitchell. And now the introduction in Diné, Bazaar, the Navajo language. Yate, she, Kyle Mitchell, Yinche, Twitter, Nin Lishle, Nakai, Bussashin, Kayaani, Deshache, Nakai, Deshanala. Shache, a Jim Mitchell, will ye? Shimasana, a Eileen Mitchell, will ye? Kilsui, Bitua, Denasha. So for those of you who can't see it, it just says speaking Diné. That's all. That's all. One day we'll get there. One day we'll get there. All right. So I want to share a story again about the Grand Canyon and just through a different perspective, an indigenous perspective and a modern perspective. So many, many, many years ago, when I was about eight years old, so just a little bit shorter than I am now, I used to go on trips with my grandparents, uh, my grandmother and my grandfather. So in our culture, we call our grandmother our son, and my mom's dad, your maternal grandfather, is Che. So my grandma and Che, they would love to travel all across the state. And they would do so in this early 90s Ford pickup, single bed, long bed truck. And then they put the camper on there with the igloo, a bunch of mattresses, and that's where I would be. And when, when I was a good boy, I was able to snake through the back window and enjoy some of the AC. All right. So we were traveling one summer. We found our way up the Grand Canyon. And it was my first time being there that I can recall. So we get to the Grand Canyon, we park, and then I just remember there was tons and tons and tons of people. And it was the most RVs I've ever seen in my life. And this is all coming with the perspective of seeing a Walmart parking lot. Like, okay, there's a few more vehicles than a normal Walmart, so this is big. So we get out and we start making our way towards the rim. And I remember walking down the sidewalk, just being tired, like, oh my gosh, and just people just in huge waves passing us by. My grandma's holding on to my hand. I'm walking, just looking at all these different people, speaking all of these different language, all to come see this beautiful sight. So finally, we get to the edge of the rim, and there is the railing. It's not as beautiful as it is today. It was, I think, just one single bar, and that was it. And people were reaching over, taking pictures, and doing all these things. And I'm just a little guy like, looking, like, where are they looking at? What are they looking at? So finally, we move off to the side, of course, where there's not so many people. And finally, I look, and I'm like, oh my gosh, right? I just look as far as the eye can see, and I see the canyon. Look as far as I can see this in this direction, the same thing. I don't have to tell you how it looks because it's actually right behind me. So seeing this view as eight years old just kind of blew me away. And all these people were taking pictures and then moving on and taking more pictures and then moving on. And my grandmother looks around, looks around at the people, and she gets really quiet. Like that awkward, you know something's going to come, right? Kind of tight-lipped. She grabs my hand, my hand, she pulls me closer. She says, do you know that this canyon is special to us? This canyon is sacred to us, to me and to you. So she starts telling a story about her great grandfather. She says, long time ago, they lived where Williams, Arizona is now. And at this time, it was maybe the mid maybe the early 1800s around this time. And the way of life there was to live off of the land, right? There was a lot more trees than what we see today. The air was very crisp and clear. The skies were blue. There was no sounds of automobiles, no sounds of people driving on the freeway, no sounds of railroad tracks coming by. And over the course of time, they traded a lot with the local tribes. They traded a lot with the people of the canyon. And what they did is they would hunt elk. They would hunt elk, they would kill them, they would skin them, and then they would take them to the canyon. And they would trade for different foods, potteries, and things like that. They would gather berries and give them a whole sack of wild berries, take it to them. And then after a while, there started, rumors started escalating and started building up. 
And it was all the Diné within the area. And they started talking about these men coming on horses and these men that were different than all of us. And what we call, we know as Caucasians today, in our language, we know as Bilagana. And back then, we knew them as Bilaga. And Bilaga meant people who always wanted to fight. And we knew they pushed their way. They rode on horses. They wore black hats. Some of them had uniforms. They made their way. And slowly, they started taking the Diné people in waves, sometimes in groups of five, sometimes in as masses of 20, children, women, killed the men whenever they could, and they took them on. They didn't know where they went. So after hearing about this, my grandmother's great-grandfather, he decided something needed to be done. He looked at his young kids, looked at his wife. He says, we need to do something. So what he did is he saddled up the horse, threw the blanket over there, grabbed whatever provisions they had left of meat, threw it over, put her on the horse, put the kids, one in front, one in the back, and he walked them. All the, he said it took about a whole day, you know, almost through the night to get to the edge of the canyon. They got there, the people met them, and they started talking in whatever language they conversed in back then. It's kind of broken, Diné, Bazad, a little bit of Spanish back and forth. And he took off the stag there, he laid it down, and they started talking. And then the people waved him down. And they spent the next three years of their life in the canyon. Over that time, they learned the ways of the people of the canyon, learned where the water was, were learned where the hideouts were, where everything was. After three years was up, they made their way back up to the top of the canyon. And they went back to the land where they lived. And now there were people living in houses, maybe one here, one there. They saw trees that were cut down, making their way. And when they got close, they were interrogated. Where did you come from? You don't belong here. And so they told them to leave. This land was no longer theirs. So they moved them all the way to the other side of Flagstaff and about 70 miles eastward. So in my intro, I said, Kiltsui Bitua, that's where I'm from. And that's where we live now after being displaced due to progression. So my grandma shared that story with me. She says, now when you look at this canyon, you need to respect this canyon. Without this canyon, I might have not, might have not been here. Your mom wouldn't be here and you wouldn't be here. So next time you see that, recognize it. Breathe in that air, give it thanks. Say a prayer to yourself, offer some tadadin, because without this, we would not be here. So I shared this story, it was about 2016. And as Americans, it was a rough year for some of us. Some of us were excited, it was a year of controversy. And so uh, I shared this story up at the Grand Canyon and it was amazing. So I took my wife and my son to the telling. We shared this telling just like I'm telling you now and we got done. When we got done, it was dark, pitch black outside because there's no light pollution at the park, right? So I decided, well, let's take advantage of this and let's go look at the canyon. So we drove and we made our way to the parking lot, that same parking lot I was at eight years old. I grabbed my son who was eight years old at this time, grabbed his hand. And of course we didn't expect to be there too late. So I whipped out my camera, turned on my camera phone, flashlight, started making our way. So we made our way and the wind was coming up the canyon, just hitting like an AC on blast. You could just hear dead silence and the wind whistling through the ears. So my son's holding my hand and I'm holding the light. We're making our way, making our way. And finally, we get to the edge where the rails are now and they're graciously updated. Thank you. And he's holding on to it and he's looking over the edge. And I tell him, I said, well, you can't really see much down there, but look up. And we look up and we see all the stars light up the sky just like these lights on top right here in the ceiling. And they're from edge to edge. And I start telling him stories about the stars and how they were placed there for us. And he starts looking around and he was holding on to the rail for a while. Then after a while, his hand snuck to my hand, grabbed it, snuck to my wife's hand and grabbed it. And he started crying. I said, what's wrong? I said, why are you crying? He says, well, I'm scared. He's like, because your grandmother's grandfather had this canyon 
that made him safe and that made your mom safe and made you safe and now we're safe. It's like, but now I'm not sure if we're safe. I'm not sure if I'm going to be safe, if you're going to be safe, if we are all going to be safe. And that's a tough question, a tough time to ask. We heard the story of being displaced from where we were, of people looking at this sacred land that we've had. And so I had to think to myself, on the fly, right? Because every parent has to respond. So I took a deep breath. I said, well, I said, you want to know something? Something really cool. I was like, the same blood that was in grandma's great-grandfather went to grandma. And that blood <laughs> went to my mom. And now that blood's in me. And guess what? That blood's in you. So whenever you feel sad, whenever you feel defeated, look, look to the past and know what it took to get you here. So with that, have a good night. Thank you.